So I believe that the same thing can also be considered in in case in case of Russia. So uh, the first and the, the 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 largest mistake here is that people tend to think that it's a small economy, like we heard that it's like uh, you know gas station uh, masquerading as a country and things like that. You know, it's far from that. It's far from that. It's basically the largest economy in Europe. And I just wonder uh, why would the Europe want to, um, so to say, expel the largest economy uh, uh, from their organizations? I'm not sure that that uh, uh, that is a wise thing to do. Everybody, I'm still talking to Dejan Šoškić, the former governor of the Central Bank of Serbia. And in the second part, we want to talk a little bit about Russia and misconceptions about Russia. But maybe let's start with impacts of recent decisions, political decisions. Uh, what the the U.S. and the, the Europeans decided to freeze sovereign assets of the of Russia and then even tried to somehow use those for the war to support Ukraine in, in, in the war and now decided to basically not freeze and then use the uh, the proceeds from the uh, from the interest on those on the frozen principle to and, and, and promise that to Ukraine. It, this strikes me as something very foolish in order to uh, to increase I mean this definitely decreases trust in the in the US and European uh, legal system to protect uh, assets, doesn't it? Uh, what do you what did you make out of that decision? Well, I think it was a, a very wrong decision to do to make, you know, uh, the freezing of assets, not just of Russia. We had it previously, I believe, with Venezuela, Iran, uh, Afghanistan, right? Some other countries as well. Uh, that's basically uh, uh, having an effect that uh, someone is, according to their own criteria, making decisions which are, um, uh, you know, um, having a very uh, direct impact on uh, ownership of assets denominated in dollar dollars, right? So um, whoever has dollars um, and uh, thinks about uh, the security of their deposits should now think twice because of these practices. You know, dollar has become um, uh, a, a currency that some would like to avoid because uh, these actions have been uh, taken. You know, so uh, uh, weaponization of dollar is, as is very frequently, uh, you know. Um, you, this term is being frequently used, is in my view very bad for the dollar and its role in the global finance. Dollar was always perceived as a secure asset of the country which is uh, strong economically, strong financially, respects a private ownership, uh, has a level playing field for everyone and that you can easily invest in dollars and get out of the dollars. So all of these attributes that were, uh, you know, connected to dollars, making it very, very popular, not just because of the, you know, industrial and financial dominance of the United States at the end of the Second World War, but actually in the decades later on when the, this dominance was uh, gradually being uh, lower and lower. Now with this, uh, with these moves, I think it's a very bad message. I think, um, that um, uh, freezing anyone's account uh, without uh, really solid legal grounds, and I haven't seen those solid legal grounds for this action, is a very bad message for the for the trust uh, in the system. You know, and and this system, as we know, it basically relies on the fact that you can use dollars, you can also use SWIFT for, uh, you know. Um, uh, distributing information about uh, dollar transactions, and you can use uh, these chips, the clearing system within the American banking system to clear and settle the transactions in dollars. If you weaponize these, if you say that someone cannot use this because of certain decisions being made by the executive body of the government, that is, in my view, very problematic, not just from the legal point of view, it's also very problematic for the viability of such a system in the long run. Do you um, do you already have any ideas what this new payment system that the BRICS are working on is going to be based on, or or what kind of logic it will follow? Um, probably not a single currency, right? It probably is some some other form, just an alternative to SWIFT, or do you think it's going to be more? Well, uh, you know, I would say that there, uh, if you want to make an alternative to dollar, 
uh, you will have to first of all think of the currency in which you're which you're in, in which you will be doing your payments mm. so the currency then um, the system of um, exchanging information like the swift is and then the clearing system in which the clearing a settlement is going to take place besides this you might want to have also what is very important uh, for the dollar and making dollar, uh, uh, you know, a very, um, uh, how to say, advantages. It, it's, uh, it has a lot of advantages because it has a deep financial markets. So if you want to have reserves in dollars, you have the place where you can park them. OK, mm -hmm. you can buy bonds, but you can also buy, buy a lot of other instruments and you can easily get in and get out. And that's very important if you want to keep reserves for your international transactions. So uh, is it easy to form an alternative to, to this system? I would say it's not easy. You know, it's, it's not easy. It's not going to happen uh, fast, but it is possible to gradually uh, develop certain other elements. You know, for instance, um, uh, nowadays we have, uh, let's say, several of these alternative systems which can be, uh, which can be considered to be to be uh, a viable option, you know, like uh, all of these countries, the large economies of of uh, China, India, and uh, Russia, they have their alternatives to to SWIFT system. That is, let's say, something that that people may uh, not be fully aware of, but the alternatives are already there. Uh, again mentioning the bis the bis uh, as far as i uh, follow these issues has been also active in producing something which is um, uh, called Embridge between hong kong thailand united arab Arem emirates you know based on blockchain technology and using the uh, central bank digital currencies so uh, the alternatives are there um, china has this um, China cross-board interbank payment system. Russia has the system for transfer of financial messaging. Uh, India has a unified payment interface. There was a system also being put in place by, by France, Germany, and Britain for a short period of time in 2019, basically because of the uh, Iran uh, agreement to basically um, do some payments towards Iran, but then... Um, then uh, United States went out of it, so they needed to make a system to make these payments. This Instex was only operating for a short period of time and then was was um, was terminated. But in any case, these alternatives to SWIFT you can find already. Uh, what are the facts concerning uh, the use of dollar? Well, it's going down uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, the percentage in which uh, the central banks are keeping their fixed reserves in dollars. For instance, nowadays it's roughly about 59%, but the overall FX transactions in dollars are very high. Almost 89% uh, of transactions are in dollars. And in these FX transactions, when we say 89, it's not just that 11% um, remaining are for all other currencies, but since the FX transaction uh, involves two currencies, then the overall is 200%. So this 88.5 is not as dominant as we would think, but still the dominance is there. Um, trade invoicing is roughly about 50%. Swift payments in dollars are roughly about 42%. What is also something that is going on is, is that um, China has decreased its overall payments in their international trade. Uh, below 50% is now in dollars. It was uh, almost 90% uh, several years back. Uh, all of the trade going on between uh, China and Russia is um, now dominantly in local currencies. So uh, things are changing and changing, let's say, rapidly. However... Uh, it's not going to be easy to create, uh, you know, really some sort of a BRICS currency, in my view. That's not going to happen soon. What I believe is going to be uh, going on is that you will see more and more these local currencies being traded, uh, uh, used as means of payments, and also providing additional instruments uh, in other currencies uh, other than dollar 
where people can do the investing, but not just investing, but also FX hedging. That's also important to to develop. You know the the forwards, futures, and options on certain currency currencies and 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 um, you know besides dollar. So the development, in my view, uh, is already relatively relatively uh, uh, fast. You know, the de-dollarization has been here for a couple of decades, but uh, uh, it has increased substantially in the past uh, several years. But it, it's not it's not going to be easy, in my view, to uh, fully, um, uh, you know, sidestep the dollar. Dollar still has the inertia, still has popularity, still has the, fa uh, the fact that when we say $1 billion, we do know precisely what that is. When we say one billion yen or uh, ruble, we don't know what that is, right? So, as a unit of account, it's it's really widespread in in uh, you know uh, psychology of transactors. So, I believe that dollar has definitely uh, uh, still uh, a very important role ahead of us, but gradual decrease in its importance is, in my view, uh, unavoidable. And what be, would be very important is for the uh, decision makers not to undermine uh, the system if they want to preserve it. So whoever wants to uh, preserve the dollar dominance really would need to uh, take into account uh, what steps uh, should be um, uh, taken in practice. Because this what has been done in terms of freezing the FX reserves and things like that, I would say that that's, that's uh, very costly for the uh, long-term interests of, of uh, dollar position in international finance this is why i keep wondering if this wouldn't be the place actually for the bis to to issue something at least a unit of account that everybody can link back into because the bis is the most the most independent financial institution i can think of in the world well yes but it's also dominated by by uh, the same structure of of um uh, of countries you know the the bricks yeah, are true. not in bis and um, I would say that uh, there is also another thing which is already available, uh, not very prominent, but special drawing rights, which are used by the IMF and the World Bank as a unit of account for lending and, and uh, keeping the quotas of the countries within these institutions. That's also uh, a possibility. But there is also a possibility not to create a real currency, but to create a unit of account which would bring somehow tie to certain values of uh, important uh, and always in demand commodities, you know, mm -hmm. that can also uh, serve a purpose of um, trying to develop a system in which uh, 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 currencies could be exchanged more easily directly, not through dollar. You know, for instance, today, if you if you uh, want to analyze what's going on, for instance, if if someone from Malaysia wants to buy something from China, yeah, they buy the dollar, do the payments in dollars, and then these dollars are being sold for yuan's. Um, in China. So that's two transactions. Uh, um, why would that be the case? Why would we need two transactions? Why would this need to be cleared somewhere in New York if these countries are thousands, thousands and thousands of kilometers away, having their currencies, which are not bad, they're very stable, you know, and and um, so I would say that there is, there is a, a, a very important uh, reason uh, for trying to find alternatives. These alternatives are not, uh, let's say, in uh, public circulation, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, just recently. Uh, we have to also recall that on Bretton Woods, uh, John Minor Keynes at that time in his old age was proponent of Bancor, which was, uh, in his view, an idea of a, a currency, international currency, uh, backed by gold, but also issued by international central bank. But whenever you have these international ideas about institutions, one need to also ask a question, where would they be situated, who would be governing them, who would have the voting rights, who would not have the voting rights, and so on. So that comes, that becomes a little bit uh, more complex issue than, than maybe, maybe um, people would, would consider it in first place. No, absolutely agreed. Um, maybe let's talk now about Russia. You wrote a paper or you, you gave a, a, a talk and made a presentation about com common misconceptions about the Russian economy. And I am very interested in hearing that. Can you please explain what are these misconceptions uh, and where are they circulating? You mean misconceptions in the West or on, on, on YouTube? I, I would say that, yeah. 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 Thank you for this question, because I think it's something that is uh, uh, not enough, uh, um, you know, addressed in the global uh, debate. 
concerning concerning Russia because um, it basically comes down to the fact that people tend to um, uh, consider the nominal GDP as the only indicator that can be used for uh, international comparisons. And people tend not to know that basically GDP is not a single indicator. That's a family of indicators. You have, um, you know, the nominal GDP in local currency, in international dollars, in international dollars from a certain uh, year, uh, a stable dollar or a current dollar. Then you have obviously real GDP, which is um, which um, has inflation being taken out from the nominal uh, figure. Um, you have GDP per capita. You have also GDP, um, which is which is corrected for the purchasing power parity, and that is the one that, in my view, is the only one that can be used for international comparisons, because it is basically corrected for the um, difference in the internal price levels of goods and services within uh, various countries. And maybe goods and services may be on a set, uh, similar price level if you compare, for instance, US and Canada and Australia and Great Britain, maybe even Germany. But they are very different uh, when you're comparing US and China or India or Russia or Brazil and these other countries. That's why basically uh, from the late 60s, this project of purchasing power parity has been gradually evolving, um, uh, promoted by the World Bank, uh, Ford Foundation, and uh, certain universities from the US. It has grown now to take into account, I believe, more than 170 countries around the world, uh, which are producing a corrective um, um, indicator to correct uh, nominal exchange rates. So purchasing power parity is actually uh, an exchange rate an exchange rate which is corrected for the difference in price levels. So therefore, the B GDP becomes a more realistic measure if you take this GDP um, uh, corrected for the purchasing power parity. And it is publicly available uh, on the websites of World Bank, IMF, CIA, you name it. Everyone is also using GDP corrected for the purchasing power parity. And if you take this this yeah, uh, if you take the, this uh, uh, indicator and analyze the world as it is today, which I uh, did in one of my my uh, lectures given to some people coming from the US, Germany and so on, they was completely uh, surprised that uh, this indicator basically shows a very different picture about the relative importance of national economies today in the world. So um, it shows that China is at least 20% larger economy than the United States. Then third largest economy is actually India, that um, uh, Russia is the fourth largest economy, uh, overtaking um, uh, Germany and, and Japan in last year. That then you have uh, obviously uh, Japan, Germany and so on. And the overall uh, situation looks like this. You know, um, I can even find a specific um, uh, data for this to tell you about it. That's basically um, that's basically the figure uh, coming from the World Bank data uh, maybe 10 days ago. It says the following. G7 countries totally produce 52.84 um, thousand billions of US dollars and BRICS 61.03. So maybe 15 to 20% more. Even if you take out the South Africa, the four countries, China, India, Russia, and Brazil are producing more than the G7. And that is, let's say, one, one thing to consider. Why am I saying this? Because uh, mainly we have been um, always <clears throat> uh, with, with uh, uh, this information coming from various sources claiming that the Russian economy is 1.5 billion, 1.7, uh, 1.7 thousand billion uh, US dollars, but it's actually uh, now the latest figure is. Um, uh, let me just tell you the the correct uh, uh, figure. It is 6.6.3. .6 sorry. So um, largest economy, as I uh, said in uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, sorry, 6.45. So 6.45 trillion US dollars is uh, Russian economy. And um, first of all, that's not a small economy. 
uh, when you impose sanctions, uh, you also need to, to, to take care about these things, uh, how large economy it is. Then um, what is the um, what are the vulnerabilities of this, this economy? Does it have anything that uh, they need to import uh, and they that can that they cannot produce? In case of Russia, you see the structure of the economy uh, such that they are producing basically more or less uh, all of the necessary things, you know, the energy, uh, food, uh, some raw materials, metals, you know, minerals and so on. So they have a lot of these things which uh, are very important for industrial production of EU, but also for, for any industrial production. And in my view, that's a more or less uh, self-sustaining economy. It has more than 140 million people. It very much looks to me like United States in the 19th century. They had, uh, they could have internally um, uh, <clears throat> internal development without the necessity to trade too much with the rest of the world. You know, they also have this uh, capacity to produce high technology in certain areas, and we know about those. So if you have, you know, like people very frequently. Um, uh, you know, ask a question, how did did Japan become so, um, you know, effective in producing electronics, consumer goods, cars, motorcycles after the Second World War? Well, because the, the, the qualified people, engineers from the military sector went to the civil sector and basically produced the results. So I believe that the same thing can also be considered in, in case in case of Russia. So uh, the first and the, the 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 largest mistake here is that people tend to think that it's a small economy, like we heard that it's like uh, you know gas station uh, masquerading as a country and things like that. You know, it's far from that. It's far from that. It's basically the largest economy in Europe, and I just wonder uh, why would the Europe want to um, so to say expel the largest economy uh, uh, from their organizations? I'm not sure that that uh, uh, that is a wise thing to do, uh, especially having in mind that that's uh, in territorial uh, aspect. That's also the largest country, the most populous country in Europe, the largest economy of Europe. And and the, as we know, also a very uh, important military capacity on that side. So I'm very sad living in Europe to see that uh, um, European institutions in which I very much believe in are excluding uh, uh, one of the potentially very important uh, countries from their their substance, you know. Yeah, it's, it's extremely sad, especially because this is a typically European thing to do. We do stupid things like on a like every other decade or so, uh, and and they're they're very hurtful. And then and then things go back. I mean, the 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 history of the continent of Europe is one of breaking and and going into war and then coming back together again and then, and then breaking up again. And the question is always, uh, the, will it go through violence or not? But the what strikes me with that narrative is that it seems to be important. It seems to be important to the war narrative in Europe that a large number of people believe in the weakness of Russia. And Russia, the Russian economy, just like proved now beyond the shadow of a doubt that your analysis is way more correct, right? That this economy is able to withstand uh, being ostracized from the rest of like Western Europe and, and, and the US. Um, whilst while functioning and working, the way that this is now being portrayed is that it only works because China keeps it alive. <laughs> it's also a dumb idea, but um, but that's also helpful, you know, to know that that uh, the, that economy can can trade with with the largest economy of the world, but also <clears throat> India and let's say the global South. They do not impose sanctions towards Russia. So I believe that the whole concept of you know, uh, I mean, I'm telling you this because my country has been under sanctions, uh, let's say, 20 or 30 years back. And uh, for this type of country where I come from, the sanctions might be, uh, let's say, effective, you know, because we need to import energy. We don't have enough things on our own. We are a small economy, vulnerable. We have a fiscal um, uh, fragility, so to say. I mean, I didn't uh, tell you this, but from the fiscal monitor issued by the IMF, when you look at the global picture of uh, the indebtedness of countries, you will find that uh, not just Japan is over 250 um, uh, percent of GDP in terms of public debt, United States 130 percent, most of Europe around 100 uh, percent, Russia 17, 17, 17. 
percent of GDP is their public debt. So that's an indebted country, which you, you cannot uh, hope to see reasonably, uh, uh, you know, fiscal problems easily. Secondly, in terms of their trade trade um, surplus, uh, we always think about, let's say, China, Japan, and Germany as uh, uh, export-oriented countries, because we do know their brands. But Russia has 9.7% um, uh, of trade surplus compared to GDP, which is higher than these three countries. So they, they export things without uh, necessarily some uh, easily uh, recognizable brands. You know, sometimes we buy things that we do not know that maybe they originate, they originate from, from Russia, like fertilizers or things like that, oil, gas. You know, those are not uh, products which are necessarily connected to some well, easily recognizable brand like, like whatever, BMW or Sony or Hitachi or, you know, you name it. So um, that's a different, different uh, structure of the economy. How did Russia do that? I mean, how is it possible to have such a large functioning economy and such a large also public sector and, 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 and military capacity and spend all of that money without actually going into huge debt. Um, is it is it the oil sales? I mean, how do you do 17% public debt and still have that large an economy? Well, uh, let me let me basically quote uh, what I quoted to to some of my listeners uh concerning the structure of, of uh, that economy. And that is um, uh, World Economic Forum gave uh, in 2019 uh, the overview of Russian economy and concluded that it's um, a commodities superpower, oil and oil derivatives, uh, more than $200 billion, gas also, 30 and more billion dollars, coal, 17 billion, wheat, the global leader, uh, iron fabricated products, nickel, fertilizers, cobalt, vanadium, palladium, gold, diamonds, aluminium, timber, magnesium, zinc, tungsten, copper, titanium, titanium, 45% of global production, and so on and so forth. So uh, this, is, this is an economy which is um, obviously... Uh, uh, raw material based and uh, uh, industrial capacities if you are asking me about military industrial capacities i'm not a, a, an expert at all but i do recall some some let's say lessons from history you know I, I do recall that they have been capable in second world war to shift their production beyond urals and to produce vast quantities of armored vehicles, uh, cannons, yep. airplanes, you name it. So if you once in your history, if you establish such a production capacity, I'm not sure that it's easy to forget. And I'm not sure that they will be just being laid down and and, and uh, be dissolved, you know. No, and, and they clearly have it. I mean, this is utterly obvious by now. But the, the question is, how do you organize it? And it's probably an, a matter of organization. So in the in, in Western capitalist market economies, classic ones, all of what you just like uh, accounted for oil, gold and the titanium and so on, those would all be in the hand of private institutions who would then sell them and, and make private profit out of it. And if the government wants to get its hands on, it needs to actually give them money for that right but in is it is it fair to say that the russian economy there's still more integration between the state and the actual economy so russia doesn't need to go into public debt because it has the oil like uh ross oil or what's the name i mean 51 percent is still owned by the by the government of, of of russia right it doesn't need to pay money in order to use the oil well, <clears throat> I'm not completely sure uh, whether the government is dominant is dominant owner in in many industries. I believe that the private industries are very much present in Russia today. But what I'm quite certain is that their military industrial uh, production is government owned. So when they want to, uh, uh, you know, produce something, they don't need to go to public tenders and then to have, you know, like five or six private companies. Uh, you know, bidding and things like that. I believe that in this system, it's more or less, you know, the phone call from the Ministry of Defense and a strict, uh, you know, uh, directive what to do, how much to produce and to, uh, let's say, um, uh, put into motion all of those capacities which were out there 
present even before. So I would say that they did something which for private companies would be completely irrational, and that is to keep, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, production capacities available but not used. And that is something that the normal private company would not tolerate in any way. And I would say that that is the reason why they uh, can increase production very swiftly in a short period of time, uh, which cannot easily happen in a way that you organize your military complex like in the United States and in most of the countries elsewhere, where you basically, your, your private contractors would not be willing to have this additional burden of keeping production capacity, which is not being used in uh, times of peace. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 a question of of the structure of production actually, and then the the monetary issue flows into that. But really, the seventeen percent that that really is surprising. I mean, that I will need to think about this one more. Um, is there anything else that you think that it's it's good to keep in mind when we when we talk about the Russian economy and 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 its 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 capacities, or is was that the main uh, misconception? Maybe maybe just two brief points. Um... If Russia would have been developing uh, in a way to try to build institutions and maybe gradually become more democratic society and so on, I believe that in the long run, they might achieve that uh, their um, tycoons and uh, the people who are very wealthy would then stop uh, taking the money out of Russia. Mm -hmm. Because the institutional framework would be maybe mature enough for them to keep the money in Russia. However, by these uh, measures that we have seen in the West, seizing someone's boats and, uh, you know, bank accounts and maybe some flats or villas, whatever that is, without any legal legal grounds, as far as I'm concerned, I haven't seen any legal procedure in any court with a decision to seize these assets. But those are executive orders, right? So if you have this, then I would say all of these wealthy individuals coming from Russia, investing uh, elsewhere, started to think twice and decided to uh, not to move their assets uh, away from, from Russia. So I believe that uh, investment potential in Russia from their internal sources has dramatically increased because of the fear of wealthy people uh, you know, having their assets being seized elsewhere. So that's point number one. And point number two is uh, if the West is imposing sanctions towards Russia, you know, that's a double-edged sword, right? Uh, who are we really uh, hurting more? Uh, do, do Are we hurting more the Italian fashion producers or the BMW car maker or whoever was doing well in the Russian market? Or we are, uh, if we are imposing these sanctions, then we have basically uh, free or let's say relatively free uh, parts of the relatively large market of 140 million consumers for the Chinese and local entrepreneurs to fill in, you know. And uh, if you cannot buy something from the West and you have uh, capital and you have the technology and you have the, the well-educated people, where well, sooner or later you're start, you, you will be starting producing it on your own or you will find another uh, source from, from uh, abroad or maybe the Chinese will come in and, and do it uh, immediately as a foreign direct investment as they have taken over some of the production facilities uh, th that were previously owned by the Western companies. So I'm not sure that this is in any way uh, a good policy. You know, I think that, that uh, long term uh, Europe has lost a market, but Europe has also lost a source of free energy and with uh, sorry, not free energy, but cheap energy. And without cheap energy, I'm very much worried whether uh, European economy can um, keep c the competitiveness in the global market, uh, mainly facing Chinese competitors, but also the others. It can't, and it w it probably will go the 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 protectionist route in order to safeguard what they can, which is going to to just make it worse. <laughs> yeah, but. We unfortunately, we Europeans have a habit of shooting, uh, shooting our own foots, and not just one. Usually, both at the same time. <laughs> um, I have more questions and more things that we could talk about, but we need to wrap it up here. I hope to talk to you soon again, and Dejan uh, Shoshkic. If people want to find your readings, where can they do that? 
Well, uh, maybe they can send me an email and I'll I'll uh, be will willing to to uh, you know um, uh, respond uh, in 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 the way to fulfill their needs. My email is just my name, Dejan D E J A N dot S O S K I C at gmail dot com. Reach out to the former governor of the Serbian Central Bank directly, Dejan Shoskic. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you.